for the current data. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been an enthralling uh, morning session, I must say. And to promise the same tone is, I think I would be daring, but I'm sure with the sort of speakers lined up, it's not a tough job at all. The next speaker this afternoon is Dr. Ashwini Malerao, a maxillofacial surgeon from the Naira Hospital Dental College. She's a very rare breed because A, not many oral surgeons are women, of late of course they are, and she is a very busy visiting maxillofacial oral surgeon because she believes that clinicians may need help in complicated surgeries or complications of surgeries so she is ever willing to help them out. She loves sinus lip procedures. She loves implant surgical complication management. And she is a mint fresh fellow diplomat member of the Faculty of Dental Surgery, Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, Glasgow. I say mint fresh because this happened in the month of March. She was supposed to go there personally, but thanks to the current times, she accepted a virtual uh, diplomat from them. She also has in that crowded cap of hers, a feather which says she is an international ambassador committee member of the American Academy of Oral Surgery. This is unique Ashwini and we have always seen you so enthusiastic. Yes, we are. she was the first person I recall to conduct a hands-on course in oral surgical procedures of suturing and intermaxillary fixation. So without much ado, I have immense pleasure into presenting to you, Dr. Ashwini Balera. Thank you, sir. It's an honor to hear this introduction from you and uh, good to see you. Uh, so without much ado, I shall uh, begin my presentation. So I have been given a topic which confounds everybody. Am I clear? Something, am I clear? Audible? Yes, both are good. Audio, video, both. Audible and audible both. Okay. So I've been given this topic by Sir and Dr. Arora of managing dry socket and comorbidities. Trust me, it is a tough task managing even after 25 years of practice. So it's just that you learn from your failures more than you learn from your successes. So let's see ahead and I have some clinical tips for you rather than theoretical knowledge, which just confounds and it doesn't really work once you are in practice and in front of a bleeding or a syncopal patient. So I would always like to begin with something about our country. And again, I say I proudly represent India, in India and outside too. We've been through a lot. This pandemic has tested the best of us, but with our wider and spiritual strength, this time too, we shall rise. And till then, let's stay safe, let's stay strong. So I've been practicing just oral and maxillofacial surgery for the past 25 years now. And the appreciation, the gratification which I get from my successful cases, from my patients post-operatively equals to none. I started teaching about five years back, conducting a two-day module, surgical uh, hands-on for third molar surgeries and everything about oral surgery. And that has given me a different kind of gratification too. Live to learn, learn to teach has been my recent motto. 
So what are surgical skills? Surgical skills are the foundation of every branch. You have a great general practitioner in your area. What do people talk about? Are uska heart kitna gentle hai? All they mean is that it doesn't hurt when he gives a tetanus shot. But it is an invasive procedure, right? For a physician too. So it is your invasive procedure which determine your reputation outside. So strengthen the very foundation. Mastering advanced surgeries then becomes easier. This is a student of mine who was scared to even remove a mobile tooth. And after just doing, practicing every day, every time, calling me up for difficulties, for emergencies, he developed confidence and he's now mastered almost all implant-related surgical procedures. So surgical skills give you confidence to move ahead in all other branches of dentistry. Now, if you are doing surgery, you cannot do without complication. Any surgeon who tells me he's not had a complication is lying through his teeth and that means he is not doing a single surgical procedure. That's what I would say. The more you operate, the more complications you get, the more clever you become, and your subsequent surgeries become smoother. So this is a, just a joke that surgery, uh, complications can happen anywhere, everywhere. And as Dr. Shokran, the man who founded PRF, says that surgery oral surgery means complications and why is that breathing saliva when we extract our instruments everything has bacteria oral cavity is the most contaminated area of our body so complications are bound to happen we cannot make it sterilization we cannot make it infection proof any which way we try so the complication insurance to be given today is, I'll start right from the beginning. It's about treatment planning, infection control, dry sockets and subsequent problems, handling medically compromised cases, and handling comorbidities while operating. So when things go wrong, when you're in this position, what do you do? So let's come to treatment planning. What are our objectives? Short operating time, minimal trauma to soft tissues, adjacent teeth, bone, painless procedure because no patient wants pain, and of course, no complications. And how do we get that? We get it by taking a complete history. Where do we go wrong when our history is incomplete, when we omit investigations, when we do not have a surgical plan in place, an inadequate infrastructure means incomplete set of instruments, in, uh, non-functioning x-ray machine, non-functioning suction, or a light source, or some such minor issues which can play a major role in making sure your surgery is a success. So first of all, try this history form. Type everything what the patient is supposed to have or supposed to not have in the local language of your region, not in English. And let the patient just tick yes or no, rather than make the patient write what he has or what he has gone through. Because many patients would like to either hide their history or they would not remember or they would not be educated enough to write down what exactly is their problem. If you write all this in a numerical form, in a simple language, and just ask them to tick it, you have everything right in front of you, the honest truth. Taking a surgical consent before any surgical uh, procedure, even for a normal patient, is very necessary. Now, if you see in my informed consent, this has been designed for me by a Supreme Court lawyer who's an expert in medical legal cases. What has he written? I hereby give my consent to carry out any dental surgical procedure as the doctor may deem fit and make or 
use anesthetic which are necessary for the treatment in the opinion of the doctor the they i have been explained in detail in a language that i understand the procedure and the complications now this is a common form for all the procedures for all the patients however if there are particular complications which you may think might happen such as a dry socket a paresthesia possible osteomyelitis in a post radiation patient case or anything else say a sinus perforation write it down in pen after everything take the patient signature and only then proceed with the procedure after the covid pandemic has hit us this is also a declaration i take from all my patients saying that they have given me their complete history at the same time they or their relatives or their accompanying persons will not blame me or my clinic for getting any covid related symptoms or covid post surgically post operatively after they leave my clinic before every consultation this form is signed irrespective of whether the patient may undergo treatment in my clinic or no now the first thing what we must take before every surgery which we have planned is an x ray never never attempt any surgery without an x ray and what do you see or in a x ray or what do you read in a x ray angulation angulation as determines the path of removal because if you see the first x ray it is a broken tooth what has my student not noticed over there can you see the apex and can you see the apex of the adjacent tooth it is a sharp triangular apex while the one of the broken tooth is a rounded apex if you see the rounded apex what that means is that it was curved into the buccal cortical plate or dilacerated into the buccal cortical plate so you must learn to read these fine things compare the apex of the tooth with the adjacent tooth apex check whether there is any divergency whether there is any abnormality and if you feel so immediately ask for a cbct in the lower x ray what can you see approximate distance to the maxillary sinus so proximity to the vital structure is important root morphology is important and depth in the bone is important that will determine initially itself whether the procedure what you are going to be do requires drilling or it requires simple elevation so learn to read an x ray be it a iopa or a opg or a cbct carefully opg i feel before any surgical procedure is absolutely a must to check the position of the nerve for mandibular teeth and to check the position of the sinus for maxillary teeth cbct helps us prewarn the patient of any complications by showing them the actual position of the nerve the position of the sinus thus keeping us safe from post extraction complications if they may occur coming to sterilization in surgery friends absence of infection is everything like i said oral cavity is the most contaminated part of the human body so if you are doing implants having a b class autoclave is a must however if you are doing only oral surgery a steam autoclave is good enough ultrasonic cleanser for your burrs is absolutely a must uv light sterilizer for your diagnostics and sterilization pouches for your hand pieces and other finer instruments are a must you cannot compromise on these basic tools the failure in healing is always usually due to contamination in surgery the source can be clinic environment bacteria due to aerosols and closed premises because they are air conditioned contamination from used instruments because they were not cleaned properly 
So what do you do to prevent this? Fumigation of premises every alternate day, autoclaving every surgical instrument after every case, bacilloid solution mop for table tops, operation theater tops, and even the flow. Infected abscess cases or infected patients should be the last appointment after which the clinic should be fumigated overnight. Preparing the patient is also extremely important. They rarely maintain oral hygiene or extra oral hygiene when they come to your clinic. So you have to use these scrubbing agents and there is a term used for it. It is called scrubbing, draping and painting. So first of all, ask the patient to rinse his or her mouth with betadine before you extra orally scrub or drape the patient. Get the sterilized drape from your drum. Autoclave dra uh, drape is a must. You drape the patient completely, telling the patient he's not supposed to touch that part of the drape no matter what. Then you take a betadine solution, not a mouthwash, a betadine solution mop, scrub and paint his face from inside out. That is, you first start from the nose and the lips and then take it outwards in a sun rays motion. So whatever contamination bacteria are present on his nose, on his lips, on his chin, on his mustache, you're basically taking them away from the surgical site or where your hands would be touching. Operatory, what do we think about lignocaine? What do we think about our vials? We just take them straight with our gloved fingers, but the same gloved fingers are going into the patient's mouth. So please soak your vials or your cartridges and your needles in betadine solution for 20 minutes before the surgery. Every tabletop of every surface which you might be touching during the course of the surgery should be covered with an autoclave screen. All cells and mobiles should be completely outside. Head cap is a must for your assistant as well as the patient. Patient rinses his mouth, you clean his face and you drape him completely his hands will not touch any part of his upper body. Now let's come to dry sockets and other related complications. What do we note first? X-ray reading is critical. We should treat cellulitis first. Ludwig's patient refer it to a hospital and don't treat it in a dental clinic. Never operate blindly at any point. A wider flap gives good vision and when in doubt, when you have elevated enough, when you are almost putting all your body weight onto that tooth, trying to take it out, it means it is something abnormal in the root shape or it is ankylosed and it is time to remove bone with a burr and then make the extraction trauma-free for the patient. When I say wide flap, good vision, that means what? First of all, because your vision is better, you retract a little gently. And gentle retraction means post-operative minimal swelling. Patients come back with huge swellings post-operatively. Is that because you took a bigger flap or is that before because there was enough bone removal? Not actually. Actually, the edema is because you retracted harshly. You were stretching that cheek with all your might. So always take a big soft tissue flap. You retract it gently. Instruct your assistant to retract it gently. Gentle handling of soft tissues, yes, even prevents dry sockets. In a nutshell, how do we first avoid trouble before tackling trouble? Broken tooth, please elevate thoroughly and use cowhorn forceps. Cowhorn forceps split the root, making it easier for us to remove the root pieces separately. In case of intra-op bleeding, why 
it happens because we have not taken a clean flat and we have used sharp apex so elevators which have debrided the cortical bone and caused bone bleeders so take a clean flat avoid sharp tip elevators how do you avoid secondary bleeding flush debris out before suturing and always smoothen sharp bone edges dry socket we'll be covering it in detail later paresthesia happens if more than maximum dose of la is given maximum dose for a average 70 kg male or a female is approximately 15 ml with adrenaline and 10 ml without adrenaline never go beyond that a traumatic surgery is a must avoid lacerating the lingual flap at all times because in the mandible the lingual flap contains the terminal or the fine branches of the lingual nerve and before you know it you will have lingual paresthesia so what is a dry socket dry socket means alveolar osteitis the blood clot is lost prematurely or dissolved before the wound heals underlying bone and the nerves are exposed giving rise to excruciating pain why should it happen rough handling of instruments prolonged traumatic surgery where the sharp bony margins or mutilated tissue edges have been left as it is without smoothing them and it's not always operator fault not all dry sockets are infected and it happens usually in comorbid patients patients with some systemic disorder or patients who have already had that tooth infected before in two three episodes and who have managed to subside it with antibiotics and painkillers and have come to you with chronic infected cases 2 to 5% in extraction of teeth especially in mandible is the statistic as cancellous component is less in maxilla since the cancellous component is more the blood supply is better so the chances of dry socket happening in maxillary teeth is much lesser 30% of wisdom teeth extraction cases dry sockets do happen how do you diagnose whether it's a dry socket a patient calls you up 3 days after extraction and complains of severe pain on the fourth day saying ki itne din to kuch nahi tha but abhi itna pain hua that i could not sleep and the pain radiates straight to my head however there is no swelling pus discharge or fever and then when you see him clinically you realize it's a dry socket however if the patient comes with fever and the above symptoms at the swelling foul breath pus discharge on the fourth or fifth day then understand it is not a dry socket it is secondary infection and it should be curated and treated with a fresh dose of antibiotics what should we not do in a dry socket if it's a dry socket don't ever prescribe antibiotics you are unnecessary causing an overdose of antibiotics in the patient's body let him continue with the same course which you had prescribed pre operatively post operatively don't change the antibiotics or don't add any antibiotics unless there is obvious sign of a purulent discharge don't cure it vigorously there are some people who believe some surgeons who believe that reinjecting the patient curating that socket inducing bleeding causes healing i am against that theory because my experience has taught me something else according to my experience that if i reinject if i cure it thoroughly i am causing a second wound i have to start the patient on a fresh course of antibiotic and maybe the dry socket usually has been due to his systemic disorder his smoking or his not following instructions so the next time again his dry socket is definitely going to fall so i would rather not cure it vigorously the next time if the socket is empty of any cl clot i would use more conservative methods
what do i do when the patient comes to me with no clot first of all flush the debris and the food out of the socket with a diluted betadine and hydrogen peroxide solution i'll feel for any sharp bony cortical plate margins and smoothen them at slow speed with a diamond round burr the margins of the buccal and the palatal or the lingual flap are usually yellow and torn and everted i would freshen these torn margins and just take a figure of eight suture symptomatic treatment reassurance is all that the patient requires time heals dry sockets has been my experience it takes about a week zinc oxide mixed with alveo gel these dressings packed in the socket are the best treatment modality which i have found in all these years betadine irrigation of that area every alternate day by calling the patient for checkups is a must and of course prf which i'll show you later on it really reduces the incidence so this was a third post third molar dry socket patient complained of pain on the fourth day no symptoms of purulent discharge no swelling no edema nothing right so this is how you make a zinc oxide pack take zinc oxide powder don't mix it with eugenol take these alveo gel fibers which are cotton fibers mixed with betadine benzocaine and iodoform mix them with the zinc oxide powder powder and make a regular thick pack a big pack not a small pack the eugenol and the betadine in the cotton fibers gives enough moisture for it to become a good pack just as it you would form with a zinc oxide eugenol check the opening and you have to plug the entire opening so mix it like you usually do a zinc oxide pack except the fibers are alveo gel thick one not a semi liquid form i have tried using only alveo gel i have tried using uh cephalosporin capsules i have tried using uh, almost uh, you know bone graft curating and i've realized that these packs zinc oxide with eugenol uh, sorry alveo gel they work the best so you have shaped it into a cone or a cylinder it's a big cylinder and you will now pack it through that opening and let it stay you will not change it every day the pack is big enough to plug the opening it should not be huge enough to push it right and inside and fill the entire surgical oh. socket it should be just big enough to plug the opening and ask the patient not to leak for one hour no anesthesia is required the second time when you are packing it it is slightly painful but spraying that area with lignocaine spray works so pack it at the opening right ask the patient that the dressing will stay in its place for 7 to 10 days and as the wound heals with secondary intention the pack comes out on its own so this was the dry socket this was the pack which was placed i call the patient every third day i clean the area with betadine solution make sure the pack is in its place which it usually is and by the 8th or 10th day as the wound heals by connective tissue and secondary granulation tissue the pack comes out on its own and the patient is pain free throughout PRF is a so savior. What is PRF? Plasma-rich fibrin containing the growth factors, platelets, and leukocytes. So.
So if you have a PRF machine, pack every socket with PRF and take a suture over it. After seven days, you will see such beautiful healing. No edema, no pain, stress-free healing. Many times, dry socket because of the pain factor leads to trismus. So pack the area with zinc oxide and ask the patient to do muscle relaxation exercises that is simple opening and closing and going to normal diet. Prescribing NSAIDs is a must. I believe Flexon MR or tablet Myoril Plus, which contains tizanidine, it also contains chlorzoxazone, it is most effective. Alternate hot and cold fermentation or hot and cold gargles also work very well. If the patient cannot open his mouth or is a nervous sort, you have to open his mouth for him by using a hister's jaw stretcher. In that case, give the patient a block, pack that area with zinc oxide, use the hister's jaw stretcher, open the mouth forcibly. The patient may yell a little bit, but once the spasm is released, he will realize it's so easy to open his mouth thereafter. So Hister's jaw stretcher should be used if the patient is scared to open his mouth at all. PRF, having a good patient with good vitamin D and aspirin, is aspirin gargles work really well at good bone growth. So understand this, that to prevent dry socket, ask the patient for disprin gargles, add PRF if you can, add collagen or any bone graft if you can. What's most important is that do every procedure slowly. There is no race. Slowly, systematically, a surgical plan in place and do not relax till the last suture is in place will prevent dry sockets in your practice. Now let's understand a few comorbidities. How do we manage these patients? What is oral cavity? It is a mirror. It reflects body's internal secrets, helps in diagnosis. So I'll cover all these systemic conditions and check. Now, anemia and vitamin B12 deficiency patients, they are the ones who will first go into syncope. They are the ones who will complain of fatigue at opening their jaws within five minutes of you starting the procedure. And you can actually understand who they are by their pallor of oral tissues, their bald, painful tongue, angular shellitis, aphthous ulcers, and you'll realize that there's no real dental cause for all this. So how do you treat them? Iron supplements, vitamin B12. Please raise their anemic condition till at least 10.5. HB should be 10.5 to 11 before you undertake any major surgery. During the treatment, if they go into a syncope, a glass of Electral or Glucon D works best. Patients with kidney disorders, increased BUN, a patient comes with such a report, he will always have oral ulcers, complaints of burning mucosa, halitosis, unexplained gingival bleeding without periodontal or gingivitis, ecchymosis, xerostomia, he might have secondary candidiasis infection also, and enamel hypoplasia. So first of all, get a NOC from the nephrologist. Don't prescribe NSAIDs, that's non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. What works for them is tramadol and paracetamol. So prescribe paracetamol 650 mg, that's dolo 650 mg, twice a day. In case of excruciating pain, it's ultraset. You can use steroid oral ointments for their oral oint, uh, ulcers, that's Kenacott or Tess. You can use local hemostatics if they start bleeding during the surgery, such as bone wax, ethamsil, uh, hemocoaglase, anything. Chlorhexidine mouthwash afterwards is a must. Saliva liquid for xerostomia and candid B for candidiasis 
post surgical procedure patients with bronchial asthma they will have symptoms like candidiasis decreased salivation increased calculus and gingivitis periodontitis and a high caries advise them fluoride supplements post treatment the mouthwash of choice should be the octinidine molecule so that means orahex pro and always tell them to get their own acetylene inhaler when they come to you for treatment so that if they get an attack midway they can immediately take that inhaler and calm themselves down coming to diabetes one thing i would like to clear here is that never ever ask the patient to do a hba1c test what does that give us it gives us a 3 month average so if the patient has high di by diabetes today when you want to do a surgery but he had normal diabetes 3 months back you will get a positive a good result but that doesn't show you a clear picture so before any surgical procedure you must get a blood sugar fasting or a blood sugar random test if those are within normal limits then you can go ahead what are the parameters i go by i normal is of course fasting is 100 and 120 is post lunch but if sometimes patients are chronic they say hamare to niche aati hi nahi hai so it is up to 150 fasting and up to 180 to 200 post prandial it's okay i will go ahead with the surgical procedure but i will add a antibiotic for anaerobic bacteria that is i will prescribe a cephalosporin or a amoxiclav along with a metronidazole or a tinidazole i would also prescribe vitamin c or a lycopene like sm fibro for post operative care and as an antioxidant now let's come to gerd what is gerd gastroesophageal reflux disease they have the gag reflex they have usual symptoms of halitosis they are the bruxers they have fatigue while chewing you mistakenly think it's a tmd disorder but it is actually gerd which is causing them fatigue and pain in the masseter when they are chewing enamel hypoplasia that's chemical erosion of enamel oral ulcers and tooth sensitivity and gingival bleeding the reason for gerd is usually h pylori bacteria in the stomach lining h pylori it is a absent disease or a dangerous disease for a patient to have a patient complains of gingivitis or prolonged bleeding after any surgical procedure without any blood disorder then always suspect h pylori it's a bacteria that lies in the stomach lining it is okay it is in a symbiotic relationship with the stomach lining you don't disturb me i don't disturb you till the patient is in its 40s after 40s when the stress starts when the bad habit starts uh, starts they come up via the esophagus at night settle below the tongue and cause all gingival disorders and enamel hypoplasia so there is a particular regimen of h pylori which contains levofloxacin which contains you get these kits which contains bismuth salts so consult a gastroenterologist get the h pylori treated and then take the patient for surgery if it is an emergency ask the patient to have a small meal and come prescribe antacids along with dom peridone and anti acidity that is say you know omes or rabeprazole or pantoprazole always keep the position 45 degrees head end elevation and tell your assistant be careful avoid the suction touching the tongue coming to hiv first of all protect yourself the symptoms are candidiasis herpes hairy leukoplakia anag xerostomia enlargement of parotid glands too so you have the option to refuse these cases if you have to take this case 
take it in a nursing home and keep it as the last case of the day. Rheumatoid arthritis patients, they are safe to be taken for any surgical procedure. They'll usually complain of dryness of mouth postoperatively, TMD clicking, and you will see bone loss and tooth migration in their mouth already. So it's normal treatment. Place a mouth guard or a mouth prop so that they are not fatigued and always support mandible in the cases of lower extractions. Now cardiovascular disorders. Always check BP before treatment. Fix the pulse oximeter during treatment. Use LA without adrenaline. And local hemostatics can be used. So you can use gel foam, you can use bone wax, you can use regular gauze soaked in hemocoaglase or botropase or even say stadrin or ethamsin. What about aspirin? Do you stop it? Do you not stop it? Different cardiologists have different views. If a patient is taking aspirin as a prophylactic measure without any angiography or angioplasty or a bypass being formed on him, I tell them don't stop because I want bleeding to be there so that there is good healing. However, if the patient is taking a high dose of aspirin, say 150 twice a day or something, Rather than me stop the aspirin myself, I would ask the cardiologist's opinion, what are the precautions I should take? If the cardiologist tells me that don't stop aspirin, but feel free to use local hemostatics, then that is what I would do. I would keep bone wax ready, gel foam ready, a cautery ready and go ahead with the surgery. Let's come, into, uh, come to Parkinson's uh, disease. What do we see in such cases? Cracked teeth, tooth wear, changes due to bruxism, slurred slow speech, and these medications themselves cause xerostomia, dry throat, glossitis, and taste loss. So such patients come to you. Always keep their page appointments early. They should be 60 to 90 minutes. It's wrongly written months minutes after taking medication, keep the atmosphere stress-free, don't have too many patients waiting outside, painless treatment, so use the spray, use the mouth prop to relax his mouth, ask the assistant to support the mandible at all times, cradling the patient's head from behind with a hollow pillow. Myasthenia graves disease is a disease which weakens the muscles. That's impaired mastication and swallowing. You have furrowed tongue and mucocutaneous candidiasis. So what, how should one treat them? Multiple short early appointments to avoid muscle weakness. Oral anticholinesterase agents to be used about 1.5 to 2 hours before the appointment. Consult the patient's physician to prescribe the agent, don't take the patient's word for it. Keep the appointment stress-free again. Normal LA with adrenaline can be used and normal antibiotics and NSAIDs too can be used. Patients with lymphomas, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's, do the dental treatment in the early stages. Extraction should always be prior to chemotherapy cycle. Check the platelet counts before extraction, antibiotic prophylaxis before treatment, topical antifungal agents like nystatin oral ointment post-surgically and post-surgically always prescribe soft toothbrush and mouthwash. If the patient has a hemato-oncologist, it is better to consult him for precautions before we take up these patients. Organ transplant patients, they have to take cyclosporin. Cyclosporin causes gingival hyperplasia, viral infection, and fungal infection. Take the consent of the physician. Do the treatment after six months of transplant. Use LA without adrenaline. And antibiotics and NSAIDs also should be used with caution, taking the consent of the physician in charge. 
coming to pregnancy and gynec issues. It can be IVF, hysterectomy, or hormone replacement therapy patients. They will have gingivitis, loss of taste, dryness of mouth, candidiasis, lichen planus. So always take a gynec consent. Only second trimester is safe. Use a lead apron and a thyroid collar for x-rays and local anesthesia always use without adrenal. Coming to epilepsy, epilepsy is excessive and abnormal brain cell activity. The medicine, dilantin sodium, itself causes gingival hypoplasia, bleeding gums and halitosis. So treatment should be within an hour of the patient taking the dose. Always use a mouth prop. Fix the pulse oximeter and keep checking the counts every time. Ask the patient to get his own anti-epileptic drug and if the patient goes into epileptic fit over there, immediately pop the drug into the patient's mouth and the sip of water. Ashwini, you have a minute to go. Okay, thyroid disorders, plain LA can use local hemostatics and keep BP machines handy. It's better to be safe than sorry. Now, what is most important in all this is learning how to give intramuscular and intravenous injections. So, learn how to do that and keep all these emergency drugs in your kitty you are safe. So I have already covered all this in the previous section. This was a repeat. Pulse oximeter is extremely important. And differential diagnosis between lignocaine, allergy and anaphylactic shock is very difficult to make on the spot. What is most important is giving injection avil and injection hydrocot to save life. Intramuscular will also do if you do not know how to give intravenously. Hypotension is glucose water. Hypertension is give patient Depin-5. We have covered pregnancy, lactating mothers, Moxclav combination and diclofenac is the safest. Liver cirrhosis, please avoid NSAIDs it's just amoxicillin, cephalosporin, or tramadol. Renal dialysis, take the consent of the urologist. Bisphosphonates, I wait for six months. G6-BT deficiency, I avoid ibuprofen. Cancer treatment patients, I take advice from the patient's own physician. Post-radiation, follow a strict regimen of betadine flushing, cooling, and atraumatic handling. So please be safe, then sorry. Refer patients with bleeding disorders, severe CVS status, compromised immunological status, as these can have delayed dangerous repercussions. And always have a great support group of a general practitioner, general surgeon, ENT specialist, colleagues, and mentor. It's important to leave your ego along with your footwear outside the operator. Always understand an excellent surgeon says no to dangerous cases more times than yes. These are the pictures of a few of my case classes, which I really enjoy. Feel free to take and keep in touch. Thank you to my family for standing by me. And yes, I have it all. Ambition. Love to learn. Love myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwini. Uh, that, that really was like a tutorial of uh, managing uh, complications and dry socket. Excellent. Uh, I wish we could give you more time, but you did uh, justice to the allotted time. Thank you so much. You've always been uh, uh, a person. Thank you for overshooting and not allowing time for questions. I'm sorry, there was just a lot to cover. Thank you, Santosh. Thank, thank you, sir. And thank you, Dr. Arora, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Ashwini. Thank you. All the thank best. You. Thank you, Ashwini.